All right, so let's get back. Let's welcome Harry, who's here, a PhD student from our group, to present his latest research on quantum, quantum computing for machine learning. Okay, thank you. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Henry Wong, so I'm currently a fifth year PhD at uh, Professor Heinz Lab. So today um, we are going to firstly introduce some basics of uh, quantum computing because before knowing some of those like basic uh, mathematics, um, you cannot understand like fully understand what is the quantum machine learning uh, trying to do. So uh, in today's lecture, we will have four parts. And uh, for first part, we introduce the single qubit uh, state and also the single qubit gates. And then we extend to multiple qubits. And then we introduce uh, more, uh, even more qubits and gates, which compose a quantum circuit. And finally, we introduce the current uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum era, uh, era, and then the compilation problem for the current NIST devices. So, um, so first of all, we know that uh, recently uh, the quantum computing uh, devices is uh, undergoing a very, really fast progress. So we have uh, different technologies. And then just several days ago, IBM just released uh, the newest uh, 433 qubits. So actually the number of qubits is going up uh, exponentially uh, recently. And that's not just for the superconducting, but also for several other techniques, uh, technologies such as new Biden uh, photonics uh, quantum computers. So the middle one is the Google uh, Sycamore uh, quantum computer, which proved the quantum advantage. And this one is from the uh, uh, ion from the IMQ company. Uh, the number of qubits actually uh, recently increased exponentially over time. So that's um, it's more like a Moore's law in the quantum computing, but the computing power is not just linear to the qubit number, but it's also exponential to the qubit number. So that is a double exponential increase of the computing power. So uh, before uh, getting into the quantum algorithms or the circuits, let's just have a look at what is a quantum bit. So the quantum bit is the basic component of a quantum system. So um, we call that a quantum bit or a qubit. So to, uh, to describe the state of this uh, qubit, we need to use a state vector. So just imagine what it, uh, imagine a classical system with a car here. So the car can be in different locations yeah, on this uh, horizontal line. And if we, want, if we want to describe the state of this classical system, what we can do, we can use a variable x here to uh, describe four as the location of the car, part, right? So um, besides this, this method, what, what other method we can use or mathematical tools we can use to describe the system um, uh, state? So here we can use a one-hot vector, right? We just use them as the probability of the car being at different locations. So because we know the car is a classical, uh, of classical thing, so it must be just um, at one location. It's not, it's not, it's not, uh, it is not going to have different locations at the same time. So this method is inefficient um, in terms of the memory usage because previously we just have, we just need to use one number, but now we need to use a vector, a one-hot vector to describe the whole system. So actually this method is pretty uh, useful in the quantum computing state because in a quantum, we can have multiple different locations and the, and the superposition of them. So here we can have a look at the notation of the qubit. So for classical, we can easily use either a zero or one to describe the state of one bit. And then in a quantum, we are, we are actually using the orthogonal vectors to describe the state of a quantum uh, bit. So here, the orthogonal vectors are no, uh, noted by the bracket notation or the direct notation. So here we can see um, the zero here is represented by the one called one zero vector and one state is, is zero one. And then for more complex space, we can actually use um, use not just the uh, in integers here or just zero or one here to describe state. We actually can use some comp complex numbers uh, inside this vector. So um, here we can see that uh, how can we write this state in terms of the combination of two basis states? So we know the basis are the one and the zeros and also the one, right? So actually it's pretty easy because we can decompose that to the linear combination of the zero state and the one state. So here we call a superposition of two basis states as a linear combination of the two states. And then uh, you may ask, when we have the quantum, quantum bit, how can we access the information inside quantum bit? Right. 
Unfortunately, we cannot directly uh, get the information here uh, stored in the vector, but instead we can do some measurement to the quantum bit to obtain a classical bit. So here it delineates uh, the uh, principle of the measurement. So here, uh, the measurement process is actually a stochastic process. So for example, we prepare the qubit and then we measure for 100 times. And based on the uh, inherent state of the quantum bit, we actually can uh, either obtain a zero or one. So the probability to obtain a zero or one is determined by this uh, equation. So actually the probability to get X, here X can be zero or one. It is a uh, uh, bracket notation here. So actually it's a, uh, a row vector and a column vector doing um, the dot product. And then we compute the magnitude and then take the square. So later on, we'll give an example of the probability notation here. Here, we just have a look at the, uh, notate, uh, the strange notation here. So there is a, um, <clears throat> there's a line on the left and then there's another line on the right. So if the, uh, for the column vector here, we are actually using the cat notation. So here we can see the uh, alpha or A here, it is a column vector. And for the row vectors, we are using the ground notation, so which is a conjugate transpose of the column vector. Okay, question. Yeah, that's a great question. So later on, we'll, uh, it's not necessary to use contact numbers to represent. We actually, for single qubit, we can just use uh, real numbers. So we'll later um, describe how to reduce the real numbers. Um, so here we can see that, uh, see that uh, X here can be uh, arbitrary state. So for example, if you want to measure uh, the Q0 in the zero state, that means what is the probability that we measure a classical zero from the Q here? So uh, remember that the Q0 previously we introduced is the superposition between the zero and one in this state, right? And then we know the, the vector representation for this Q, Q0. And then we just do the uh, dot production between this vector and the zero vector. So here we can see that the dot, dot production result is one over square root of two. And then we take this, uh, take the, um, uh, here we take a square here, and then we get the one over two, which is the probability that we measure uh, zero from this Q zero. Okay, so you can imagine that if we here re uh, replace the zero uh, with the one vector, that would still be one over, uh, that would be I over square root two here. So, but the magnitude of I over two is the same as one over two. That means that there is, there is still 50% of probability to measure the one from this given. Okay, so sign. Um, which one? Sign. Oh, yeah. The sign here is the state. So the sign here is a Q zero. So that is just the target state. And X is the is the measurement basis. For example, we can have zero or one because we want to measure this sign to either zero or one. So we do the dot production between the zero and the, and the state. So, so this equation, uh, what is this equation, uh, the usage of this equation? The equation of the, uh, the usage is that, for example, you have a, um, you want to know what is the a state of a qubit. You just do 1,000 times of the measurement and say you get 900 of them as one and 100 of them as zero. So you can deduct what is the initial state of the qubit according to this graph, to this uh, equation. So you are estimating the uh, qubit x. Uh, we're estimating the, the side here. For example, the unknown state, we can just uh, get some information from qubit by measurement. Right? Mm -hmm. And the measurement is, is uh, the probability we can uh, deduct back to what is the, the side looks like. So actually, uh, getting the state of a qubit from the measurement result is called the tomography. So that is um, uh, a standard process to, to, to obtain the original state from measurement outcomes. Okay, so uh, as we know, the probability of measuring zero or one should, should add up to one, right? So, and also if we just, just measure a state in itself, then that should be one because the dot production here, just uh, it is in its original state. So there should be 100% as a state. So in that case, if we uh, uh, use this uh, representation and then 
we take this uh, psi, uh, psi here, um, psi here to this uh, equation, and then we can define that the r bar squared plus a beta squared is one. So that is one constraint for the complex number um, values here. And then later we will use this to uh, to reduce the from complex number to the real number to describe the single qubit system. Okay. So besides using the one zero here, we have we, we actually can also use others other bases. So basically the quantum state is you can consider as a vector, and then you can project the vector to arbitrary state as long as they are like also uh, also normal basis basis, right? So zero and one is just one of it. There are infinite pairs of orthogonal bases. And uh, when we do the measurement, the state will, will be projected to either one of them. Okay. So there will be a, a, a global phase for the state. For example, we have uh, I1 here. So what is the measurement outcome uh, for, for, uh, for this state on the one, uh, one bit, right? the, the, the state one? So here we can see that if we do, the, uh, do this uh, equation, uh, communication, and then the magnitude of, what, of I is just one. So there will be no effect on the final measurement outcome. So that means, the I1 and 1 here are actually equivalent in all ways that are physically relevant. So that means the global phase here is actually, uh, we cannot detect that. So in that case, uh, the uh, two state with the global phase is actually uh, identical from, from our point of view. Okay, so here comes to a very interesting part, which is called observer effect. So that means when we do the measurement of the qubits, the qubit will collapse. So previously, that is a Q, Q0 with the superposition of one and zero. So after we do the measurement, so say if we get zero, and then the state itself, we also collapse to zero state. So that means we cannot, um, we cannot like reuse the state after we observe this state, right? So that's that's why typically all the quantum circuits, uh, the measurement are performed at the end of the computation. So otherwise, the information in between will be lost. When we do the measure, when we do the observation of the system, we, we cannot uh, further keep the keep the information. So uh, when we do, do the measurement of multiple qubits, so for example, ten qubits, we are finally get a series of classical bits, just like a measuring one bit. Okay, so here uh, is a very famous um, story of the Schrodinger's cat. So why the cat can be in a superposition of the live or die? So that uh, that is because uh, uh, it, uh, remember that we can create a superposition between the zero and one. So uh, the probability of the uh, of this uh, laser like uh, emit uh, like a uh, photon here to this uh, switch is also a superposition between zero and one. So if it is uh, emitting one photon, then in that case the poison here will kill the cat. But if there is not, uh, the cat will keep alive. So because this one is a superposition, so that means the switch is also a superposition. Before we do any measurement or observation, that's a superposition. We don't know what is exactly the same. And that means the, the, the poison here is also in a superposition of like a brick, brick bottle or a, like a not brick bottle. And that, in that case, the cat is also, we cannot know whether it's leaf or uh, living or not. Yeah. Okay, so uh, here it comes to the question. So how many free variables are there in a state? So here we know that the Q here is R plus zero and uh, plus beta one. Um, and then we, we know that most of them are complex numbers. But actually we can uh, reduce that. Uh, for example, here we can take out a global phase. And in that case, um, the exponential term, the EI phi here is, uh, can be, uh, can be uh, removed. So in that case, there are only three uh, variables for the real number here. Three real number variables here to describe the system. Uh, alpha, beta, and phi here. And another uh, thing we just detect is the alpha squared plus beta squared, that should be one. So that adds up, adds up another constraint on the, on the values. So in that case, we can just assume that alpha is cosine theta over two and beta is sine theta over two because that will satisfy that the uh, sum of the square will be one, right? And then in that case, we just have two free variables, theta and, and phi. So in that case, uh, as summary, there are only two free variables for one state. And here, actually, we can consider the theta and phi 
as the spherical coordinate of a sphere, which is, we call the block, block sphere. So here we can see the theta is actually the degree between this vector to the uh, to the uh, z z axis, and phi here is the degree between the vector and the x axis, right? So in that case, um, we can have like arbitrary state, and then each state will be represented as a unique dot on this block sphere. That is a sphere representation of the cubic state. Uh, one is the state one. Uh, remember that previously we introduced the, the basic state one and basic state zero. They are actually like two poles of the block sphere. Yeah, here if you see like if theta is uh, is uh, is pi, and then uh, pi here is zero, and then we can get one, right? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great question. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, that is pretty in intuitive, but it's, it's not that intuitive when we come to multiple qubits. We always very difficult to have a sphere for multiple qubits. Okay, so uh, here we have like, uh, we, we introduced the state. And what, what is interesting is that how can we do some manipulation of the state with some quantum gates? So here we, uh, we, one thing we should know is that all of the quantum gates are reversible. So the reversible concept is not that important in a classic compu computer because, um, because the information can be observed or duplicated for many points. So, for example, in the uh, CMOS, we have the different gates, like the um, like the XOR gate. That's not that's not reversible. And also, like um, uh, uh, some other case, if the case just have one output from two two inputs, that's definitely not reversible because we cannot determine what is input from just one output, right? But what is the uh, example of the reversible gate? So here we can we know the, the reverter, right? So the knock gate. So here we have the knock gate as a reversible gate because it's just applied on a single period. And if the result is zero, we know the previous one is uh, previous result, previous input is one. Right? So here is a uh, question: what is the simplest reversible gate in a in a class of computation? Yes, exactly. It's identical. So it's just you just do nothing. And it is, it's of course, an ident identity matrix. So it's the simplest reversal case is just the identity case. Um, so for all the reversal case, they can, re they can be represented as matrices or the locations around the cross here we just introduced. So here we can see several uh, very representative uh, gates. So the X gate is actually implementing a, a reverse operation. So that means, um, say, if we have the zero as input, which is represented by the one zero state state. And then we apply this X state to this state, and then we can obtain another vector, which is zero one. So we know that zero one represents the one state. So that is a line with our intuition in the classical communication where we find an object with zero that will give us one, right? So uh, there are also other cases, uh, like uh, there are actually a uh, total of three, uh, four like poly gates, the, the identity, Function just mentioned, and also the XYZ. So for the Y case and Z case, they have this uh, this uh, this forms. And for yeah, they are related to the XYZ. So actually, the case here, uh, we will introduce the the what is the gate, uh, what is the XYZ gate in relation to the to the box here. I think yeah, right. So uh, we can see that. Uh, uh, just a quick question. What happens when we apply this Z gate to the zero state? So remember, Z gate is one, zero, and zero minus one. And then if we do the mesh modification to the to the one, zero, that would be the state. The result will not be changed. And if you apply that to the one state, that would be that will give a minus one. So remember, previously we introduced the global phase. So the minus one here is actually indistinguishable with the one state, right? That means when we apply the D gates, actually nothing happens. Zero is still zero, one is still one. So that is because the zero and one states are the eigenstates of the D matrix, right? And then the commutation forms by this uh, zero and one state are actually called the D basis, which is actually on the block sphere here. Um, we can see the zero and one is the D basis, right? And then we can see there are also X spaces, which is the two poles um, intersect with the X axis. This is the uh, the, the path here, the path 
state. And the one in the, in the, in the back, uh, it has, like in the back is the uh, minus state. And then we also have a y basis, uh, like uh, a perpendicular to both the x and also the z, which is here. So the, the left one is called the left state, and the right one is the right state. That's how this um, the basis is correlated to the to the gloss here. Yeah, question. If the Z matrix has the same effect as applying just the identity diagonal matrix, why do we use that with the minus instead of just by identity matrix? Yeah, because that will have some different effect when we have multiple things. Yeah. Just one single one that is the same. But for model multiple ones, that will create a relative phase, relative phase between different features. Then that's that matters. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Great question. Could you explain again why the case is that the positive is like the reverse one? Because uh, to me, that means the space in the quantum computer cannot be used. So all the information from the input, the output, they must be, they must be the same dimension, or else it's not like the reverse thing. Uh, it's not the reverse thing. Yeah. So the, uh, the reason why it's reversible is that all the operations we are, we are applying is a unitary matrix. So the matrix defined operation, and operation defined by unitary matrix is inherently in reverse way. And if, if we want to uh, uh, do some computation like a uh, like a x x or gate, so that can be that can have a reversible version. If uh, for example, we just duplicate the first bit, we opt out to both the first one and also the x or one, then we can convert a non-reversible gate to a reversible one. So in that case, all the chance of innovation can be done on quantum computer. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't understand how they were going to do it. The exit was the complex, right? Yeah. It was a matrix. Yeah, X is a matrix. And the two bases, um, like two bases here also. Two bases here are the, uh, actually the eigenstate of this matrix. So the eigenstate. Uh, the plus means the state at this point, and and minus means the state at this point. So that's just two two states. Because one state you can consider as one point on the block sphere, right? And and plus state is the ground point, minus state is the back point, and those two points uh, forms two vectors as this and this one, and those two vectors are the eigen states of the X matrix. So in that case, when we apply the x, when we apply the x state to this two state, nothing will happen. Yeah. Okay, so, um, and then we can have a look at some other uh, fancy case like the Heimer case. So the Heimer case is actually very important for quantum computing because when we include a classical state, for example, the zero or one, and if we apply a Heimer gate here, that, that will create a superposition which we we are presuming right so for example the h here we apply to the zero state that will create the plus state that is a superposition between zero and one and uh, again for the one state here it will create a minus state and also we have some other single qubit gates some of them contains parameters for example this one is the phase state which contains the ei phi as the uh, one of the parameters so we can actually change the parameter here to uh to apply different kinds of uh, effect using this case. And also, again, we have some other case uh, like the S and S dagger. Okay, so finally, we are going to introduce this U gate, which is a universal, or it contains all possible gates. That means all of the single three gates you can represent with these three, uh, three uh, uh, rotation angles. For example, the H gate can be represented as U uh, over 205, and P gate is just a U 009. Okay, so we finally finished uh, the most uh, difficult part, which is the single pivot, and then we just naturally extend that to multiple quantum bits. So uh, first of all, we know that for two bits, we can have four possible uh, states, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So just use the knowledge we just learned. For the two quantum bits, let's naturally have a superposition between those four different states, right? So that is uh, delineated here. So we can also use a vector to represent this. So question here, how many, how many entries here if we have n bits? So here with two bits, we have four. One bit, we have two. 
Yes. Yes. So here we can see for the for the uh, n qubits here, we actually can have two to the power of n uh, magnitude in the state vector. Like three qubits, we have eight. Two qubits have two. And so that's the part of the reason why it is very difficult to simulate the quantum computation on classical computer because the memory is easily overflow. So you, you, you want to simulate 100 qubits that requires uh, 10 to the power of 30 around like uh, uh, numbers to, to store. So that's uh, almost uh, impossible, even for the, 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 the most powerful supercomputer. Okay, so another examples on the measurement on, and also the, the normalization principles also apply to multiple qubits. It's a natural extension from a single qubit. Okay, so here we can have an exa uh, have an example. So here we have the H gate applied to both quantum uh, quantum gate zero, qubit zero, qubit one, and qubit two. So we can represent this whole state because we, we, we know that when we apply H to the to the zero state, we have the plus state. So that's basically just plus plus plus, and then represent the state vector that is one over square root of eight of, eight, of all one here. And again. We, we want to have a look at what happens when we apply the single qubit gate to multi qubit system, right? Before before introducing multi qubit gates, we just have a look at single qubit gates. So uh, this uh, this is a with a reminder of the previous like high gate, and then when we apply when we have a separate gate on two qubits, so for example the x on the q1 and the h on the q0, so that is simply a chronicler or chronicler product. Between the matrix of those two uh, two matrices, here we can compute the joint matrix of those two gates, or we can simply just uh, write that as zero h h zero, which is a clear form. And again, if we are doing this uh, x gate on q one and nothing on q zero, so that is actually a chronicler between x and the identity gate. Right? And then we can we know that the overall uh, matrix representation of this gate is this uh, four by four matrix. Okay, so here it comes to the most, maybe most important uh, two qubit gates or multi qubit gates in the, in the field of quantum computing, which is called C naught gate. So C naught is essentially doing, uh, contains two parts. One is a control qubit, another is a target qubit. So Q0 here is a control qubit and Q1 is target. So if the Q0 is zero, then there nothing happens on the Q1. But if the Q0 is one, we apply a naught gate on the Q1. So that's the, how we consider this as the, uh, this is the true, ta true table for this gate. And here, if we represent that as the uh, matrix representation, we can see uh, column wise, that's the output 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And uh, row wise, that's input from 0, 0 to 1, 1. So we can see the one here. That means when we input 1, 1, the output will be 1, 0. Okay. so. Um, the C naught, when we consider this state vector, so actually it's, it is performing a swap of the 1 1 state and 0 1 state here. So here we can see 0 1 and 1 1 here. But after C naught, is actually the value in these two locations will be swapped. Okay, so here comes to a very interesting part of the uh, one of the two most interesting parts in the problem. One is the impactor, uh, one is the superposition we just introduced previously, another is called entanglement. So how we can create an entanglement between two qubits, right? So here is how. Firstly, we apply a H gate on the Q0, which we should uh, convert this whole system to the zero plus state, which can be represented as the zero zero plus zero one, right? And then we can apply this C naught gate we just introduced to this system. And what happens to that? We can see that the one for, for this state, um, for the zero part of the class, that will not change. But for the one part of the class, that will also reverse the first zero, right? So that means the resulting state is a super is an entanglement uh, or superposition between zero zero and one one. So the interesting part of this is that, um, say we do the measurement of Q zero, and then we get a classical zero. So what happens to on the uh, qubit one? Because all the all the probabilities are in either both zero or both one, right? So in that case, when we do the measurement of Q1, we also obtain the same result of the Q0. 
So that is uh, here we can see some simulated result. So all of the measurement outcomes uh, properties will be in the both zero or both one here. So that that creates the spooky act, spooky action action at a distance. That means even we separate those those two qubits light years away, even two ends of the universe, and then we do the measurement of one qubit. So that will immediately have effect on another qubit because the result of the measurement will be must be the same, right? So that means here. So if we separate them to very far away, and then we do the measurement of one of them, and then the, the state of two qubits must be the same. However, you may ask whether we can use that to compute, do some communication to send one bit information. Unfortunately, that's not possible because of the non-communication theorem. So here we can see because of the measurement result is totally random. So we don't know ahead of time what will be the zero, what will be zero or one. So in that case, we cannot make some plan ahead, or we cannot let another side know what is the what 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 is information I want to convey. So first of all, the re result is random, and also like the measurement statistics of one bit is not affected by another one. So, uh, it's not affected by operation on another one. So that means we cannot share any information across this entanglement qubit. A little bit disappointing, right? But the, for the uh, for the communication, we still use this entanglement uh, uh, heavy. Yeah. So another thing is about uh, phase heat feedback. So uh, in, uh, because of the time, I will uh, skip this uh, this phenomenon here. Um, so uh, here we introduce some more commonly used multi-qubit gates. For example, the CZ gates uh, that is just a controlled C uh, between those two qubits, which is uh, uh, equivalent to the Heimer gates and then seeing out the Heimer. And also we can apply this swap gate between the Q0 and Q1. So that is equivalent to three spin off. So the swap, according to this, uh, the name, is just doing some doing the switch of the information between the two qubits. So after the swap, the information on Q1 will be on Q0, and the previous information on Q0 will be on Q1. So that's why it's called a swap swap. And again, we also have some uh, parameterized uh, multi qubit bits. For example, here, the, the control rotation X contains the theta here. So the parameterized gates are actually pretty important. For different kinds of applications, including the quantum engineering, because if we want the model to have some learning capacity, we need to have some tunable uh, parameters or tunable settings in the model. So the uh, so the um, parameterized gates provide the freedom that we can change the the, the system setting. Right. Okay. Here we come to uh, second three, which is quantum circuit. So now we know the the basis of of the base, and also we know the case. So we, we can just un, like uh, make them uh, together, which is like uh, construct a quantum circuit. So here we can see that uh, first of all, for some of the algorithms, we have the initialization or reset of the initial uh, initial qubits. For example, we can initialize to the zero state or some other state, and then we apply some quantum case like the Heimer case, signal case, or any other case you want to apply. And finally, we do the measurement. So the measurement process is uh, stochastic. So we we need to prepare this state, the circuit for multiple times, and then measure multiple times to get a meaningful distribution. And then even after the measurement, uh, so for example, we do the measurement and then we have this uh, two lines, typically two lines as a combination means the classical information, and one line means the quantum information. And then we can use this classical information to apply uh, a not gate. So that means when we do the measurement and the measurement outcome is one, we apply a X. If not, we, we don't apply this X. Okay, so we can have a look at a simple adder circuit, which is doing the adder using the quantum circuit. So the basic component is a C not gate. So for example, if we do an X gate on the Q0, and then we do a, uh, do a C not gate, so we construct the truth table. So we can see that the measurement outcome on Q1 here is actually. So if two zero here, the output is zero. Zero one is one, one zero is one. If two are one, then here the Q1 is still zero. So that is implementing an XOR of the two inputs, right? So, and then uh, we, uh, because we don't want to, um, because we don't want to like uh, measure the Q1 information. So here we just extend the circuit with 
uh, another common bit. So here, so basically we just uh, doing the two x here, and then we have the c naught between q zero and q two, and q one and uh, q one and q two, and then we do the measurement. So for example, if we want to have uh, we can have a computation here, maybe q one here one one, and then after x is zero zero, and then the result will be zero. If, if there is one, there's a zero one here, and then the result will be one. Right. If both of them are zero, and we have two x gates, so the result will be still one. So that uh, satisfies the, the, the half either uh, requirement. But there is also a, a Q3 here. So, um, so we, we actually um, can compute the carry bit using the Q3. So here, actually, if both of them, uh, if one of them um, is, uh, is one, and then the, the result should be, um, should be one. So if both of them is zero, the result should be uh, zero. So if we use this control, control not, so the result will be uh, satisfied the, the correctness for a parity. So this is just example for the uh, either circuit. So um, here uh, I will use like two minutes to introduce one algorithm, which, uh, which uh, tells why, uh, why we have this uh, parity circuit. So imagine we have a black box that computes a function map from a single single bit to another single bit. So the computation is very just a input one and then output into zero output. So but the computation is very complicated, which takes one day. So so how can we know that x? We need to do two times of the execution. That takes two days, right? And then so assume we only need to know whether fx is constant or balanced, that means what is five to zero or one, whether the result is the same. So again, we should we need to run two days to do the determination. But with a quantum circuit, we actually can compute a circuit which compute the fx using a quantum, quantum machine. And then the intuition is that um, the uf is the, the, the function to compute that. So when we do the uh, do the do the computation, we can input. The, the superposition between the zero and one. So for the second qubit, we can include this one. And for the first, first qubit, we can include the, uh, this uh, plus state. And then uh, we omit the computation here. But the final result is that here we can see uh, if f zero and f one are both, uh, both one or both zero, that means const, const, uh, constant, we can immediately measure uh, this as the plus state. Or if that is balanced, we can measure them as a minus state. That means we, we only need to run for one day using the quantum machine to get the, risk, get the answer for this question. Okay, so I think that's um, uh, the, the last section is the next arrow, but uh, uh, basically it is uh, telling that the current, current device is very noisy and the size is not uh, large enough. So we have to develop some of the algorithm and device, the algorithm and hardware fully designed methodologies to improve the power of the current devices. So uh, due to the pandemic, I will omit uh, the human mapping process. So uh, as a recap, today we introduced the single qubit states and gates, quantum qubit states and gates, and also combined to get together at the quantum circuit and how to run the quantum circuit and do the compilation on this device. The next lecture, we introduce the quantum machinery. So uh, thank you very much for listening.